So for later, see we have this quadratic inequality, and well, we are going to pretend that we are solving an equation. So how about that? So let's turn this into one equation. X squared minus 5x plus 6 equals to zero. Solve the equation for x, and well, we're going to find what we call the critical values for the inequality to test them for positive and negative depending on what we ultimately want. Well, any ideas on how to solve this polynomial equation? Yes. By factoring. Is that what you mean by factoring? Right. Well, when it comes to factoring, a trinomial whose leading coefficient is one, we use what I call the double bubble method because well, we have like double bubbles here. Put the x's for each factor and well we're going to look for factors of six that add up to negative five and those numbers are negative two and negative three because negative two times negative three is going to be positive six but we want to make sure that the sum of those two numbers is negative so hence we get the negatives for both right that equals to zero from the zero product property we get that x equals to two and x equals to 3. Well, what are those numbers? These are the numbers that we call the critical values and those critical values are, are going to be plotted on a number line but the way we plot, we plot those critical values uh, depends on the inequality symbol that we have and that's the part where we need to be very very careful about. So let me plot those numbers. So 2 and 3 on the number line. However, those numbers are going to have an open bubble. In this case, not a solid bubble because of the inequality symbol. In this case, we have a greater than, not greater than or equal. If we had the greater than or equal otherwise, well, then it, they would be solid bubbles. But in this case, it's open bubbles. All right. And this is the number line that we use to plot those numbers. We will use the, we will use this sign chart, sign chart to test those intervals. In this case, when we plot the two critical values, this gives rise to one, two, three intervals to test. Okay. And then what we do in this case is write the two factors that we got from the factoring of the equation or the polynomial right next to the number line. And in this case, well, because we want to test every single interval, let's choose test values, your favorite number in this interval, and choose the easiest number. What, what would be a good number here? One. Zero. Zero is the, yeah, or one. Yeah, zero or one, either way, it should work, as long as it's less than two. But I mean, with the reason why we choose zero, we said it because, I mean, the zero reduces a lot of calculations, right? And what about between 2 and 3? There may not be an integer, so we would have to go with a decimal, 2.5. Any number larger than 3 in that interval? 4. Okay. So this is what we do. Evaluate these two expressions here at the test values in this case. Um, I'm going to evaluate 0, so 0 minus 2 which is negative 2, but I really don't care about the result. What I care about is the sign, so in this case it's negative, right? 0 minus 3, that's also going to be negative, okay? Let's test the second interval, 2.5. What's 2.5 minus 2? Is that positive or negative? Positive. What about 2.5 minus 3? Negative. negative, perfect. The third interval, 4. 4 minus 2? Positive. 4 minus 3? Okay, so we are going to multiply the columns of these signs to get the, the correct, the, or rather the overall sign of each interval. Negative times a negative? Negative times a positive? Positive times a positive? Okay, now we are going to go back to the original problem, the inequality sign. What are we looking for? 
positive number. Positive number. This greater than zero implies that we're looking for positive. So what we're what we're going to do here is shade only the the intervals with positive sign. So that's going to give us the solution. But of course, that's only the graphic representation of the of the solution. We need to write this solution as a in interval notation. So describing this using interval notation, and I'm gonna make a mistake on purpose so to see if you can catch it. All right. What's wrong with this? The brackets. The brackets, right? Yeah. Brackets imply inclusion of the endpoints, but because our original inequality doesn't include the equal part, well, then it should be parentheses, all right? Hmm? Hopefully, I mean, this rings a bell from pre-calculus or any, any algebra class that you took in the past. I mean, maybe you saw this in a different way. Maybe you actually cared about the values and not just the signs, but I mean, it's different ways to get the same, to gain the same result, all right? Because ultimately we want to know the signs, so not really the values. Another piece of information, very important piece of information in calculus that we need to be aware of is the absolute value function and what it means. Well, um, you may have some ideas about absolute values already, maybe from the graphic point of view. It's, uh, it's the V-shaped graph, right? That's some of the, uh, of the points that you might have on your head already from the past. Well, that's that's important, that will be very important to know, yes? And, but, oh, but in terms of what the definition is of, of the absolute value, uh, the absolute value which is denoted A, or well, the absolute value of A, is denoted with bars, these bars, and this is to denote the distance from zero to whatever that value of A, so, and well, we have a condition here that whenever we have uh, for, for values less than less than zero for negative values that a is negative and positive for positive values and it's a this is an idea that it's used you know in a, uh, and when solving quadratic equations when deriving the square root property well there's more there's a lot of implications behind and uses of this and of course we have some properties you know like uh, the, pro the, the absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values the absolute value of a quotient is the quotient of the absolute values but with the condition that the quantity in the denominator is not zero because of course we get an undefined result the power, the power rule again, I mean it's, these are I think pretty straightforward rules, but the one that we want to, to pay special attention is this one, when we, when we solve absolute value equations, and I'll show you how do we use this, how do we interpret this ultimately, so the, re the other two, five and six, are to solve inequalities involving uh, absolute values. So, but we're, we're not going to do all this. I just want to show you the definition. How do we interpret from absolute value to, to this piecewise definition? And then uh, I'm going to show you how to solve an equation, but most importantly, rather than just following, a, you know, like a recipe to solve an, uh, an equation, I think the interpretation is what, what really matters the most because we need that idea when it comes to later concepts like limits, derivatives, etc. as we construct all these ideas and we put them together. All right. So this is what we have here. We have an expression containing absolute value bar, the absolute value of 3x minus 2. And we are being asked to rewrite this using, without using the absolute value symbol. Okay. What do they want ultimately? For example, let me take it back to the original definition when we have the absolute value of x. Instead of having the absolute value of a as before, this would be negative x when x is less than 
zero and positive x when x is greater than or greater than or equal to zero, all right? And well, this gives this is a given rise, and well, rather we can we can connect this with uh, with the graph. So to just to be consistent, let me let me show you the graph. And again, uh, calculators are really not necessary. So I'm just, oh no, this is in parametric form mode. And Y, okay, clear, clear. So let me go to math, num, apps for the absolute value bars of X. And let me graph this function. Well, that's the, the V-shaped graph that you know, I mean. So this should be consistent with the, defini with the piecewise definition of the absolute value function. Do you see this line right here with negative slope? And then you have another line, but with positive slope. So that's the first, con the first part of the piecewise. Negative x, the one with the negative slope, for x less than zero, that is for values of x that are negative, and y equals to x with positive with positive slope for for values of x that are positive, right? So that's where, and of course, I mean, uh, another key uh, key uh, key uh, concept with this type of functions is the shiftings, you know, shifting to the right, up or down, you know, the usual. All right. Now, how are we going to describe? How are we going to describe this using uh, without using uh, absolute values? In this case, instead of x, we have a three x minus two. So let me rewrite this. Three x minus two. So it's going to be negative the quantity three x minus two and the quantity 3x minus 2. Number one, the first condition, the negative, whenever 3x minus 2 is less than zero, that is, it's negative, and the second part of the piecewise function, whenever 3x minus 2 is greater than zero. But of course, that's not the final answer, that's only the first step, the setup of it. So we need to solve this baby inequalities here, or greater than or equal. This baby inequalities here for the variable x, so they look more like this. So, I'm going to rewrite this, uh, I'm going to distribute the sign here, that's 2 minus 3x, and 3x minus 2. So, adding 2 to both sides and then dividing, that's x, um, well, let me do the whole thing on the side. 3x minus 2 less than 0, that's 3x less than 2, and x is less than 2 thirds. Less than 2 thirds, and x greater than or equal to 2 thirds. Well, what are we going with this? So, coming back to, to the original absolute value function, uh, absolute value of x. This value that we have in the condition for each part of the piecewise uh, of the piecewise definition of the function, isn't it the same value of x of the cusp of the absolute value function, isn't it? All right. So we're going to get something similar in this case for the new for the new absolute value function that we have in here we're gonna have these equations of these two lines having a cusp at two-thirds okay let me let me plot that um, that function so that's gonna be absolute value of uh, what is it 3x minus 2 3x minus 2 and let's graph and if we look at the graph again we have to two parts the linear function with the negative slope, which is this one, and we have the second part, 
of the absolute value of this absolute value function the counterpart with a positive slope and where's the cusp i mean it's it's kind of hard to see because of the scaling of the graphing of the graph right here but do you see that the cusp is at two-thirds just like in in the conditions for for the uh, for the absolute value function so so that's how we check for the consistency between the concept the graph and how we manipulate this expression algebraically of course uh, it's important to have to check all this so just to make sure that we're on the right track all right but i mean the main takeaway for for solving um an, an absolute value equation that's what we really need in terms of what the concept is okay again let's take it back to basic intermediate algebra all right what it, what how do we solve this equation absolute value of x minus 3 equals to 2 what, what's the process to solve that equation you could take plus 2 and minus 2 Plus two and minus two. Uh, someone raise a hand over here. I was gonna say you solve it twice. Once. We solve it twice, right? We solve it twice. So, uh, so most likely, I mean, we were just told to do it that way. So that is split this into two separate equations, right? The one equation x minus three equals to the same number with opposite sign, and x minus three with with the positive value right basically without the absolute value part. so that's what we were told in algebra to to do in order to solve this equation and solve each equation individually okay so add three to both sides to get x equals negative two plus three which is one and at at uh, add three to both sides again to get x equals to five all right so we get two solutions which is kind of weird because our equation looks like first degree equation because of the power x which is one right however this is how this is a different type of equation and the way we're going to interpret its result it's via the concept of absolute value okay well ultimately what does in words what does that equation uh, tell us about so number one let's let's write it down let's spell it spell it out so uh, this equation tells us um, the values of x that are a distance of two units from three okay and well and, and in this case absolute value that's why we have two solutions because for example if i'm standing at the number negative three here i if i move two steps i can do it on one direction and the other direction as well so there that's why we have two solutions how about we see this graphically okay so so there's our zero that's one two three four five six negative one negative two negative three negative four etc one two three so just label well we may not need too many too many numbers but uh so here our center is the number three so the center is the number three okay two units or rather no not not three actually the center yeah it's three uh there are two units away from three yes okay so if i move two units towards the right of three where do i get to is it five? Is it one of the solutions to the equation? But we can also move two units in the other, in the opposite direction. Uh, that's uh, two units, and we get back to one, isn't it? The other solution to the equation. Have you ever seen before 
this uh, this point of view of solving an, of what an absolute value equation is, or where you were told to just solve two separate equations. Just solve them, right? So, well, it's important to know the definition and how the picture connects and ties with the whole with the whole idea here. Okay, so I mean, I, I think this is uh, this is what we have for this appendix section. We're reviewing some of um, some of the uh, absolute values. Let's move on to another another topic here and let me area where is it okay i know i had it here it's appendix b oh here it is okay another piece of information that we need to review here is uh, I mean, getting back to be familiar with the coordinate system, geometry, and especially equations of lines. And the reason to this is because we are going to uh, to construct the, the concept of the derivative via finding the equation of a tangent line to a given function. So first we're going to start with the problem of the secant line, then we are going to introduce the limit concept to make that secant to become a tangent. And well, of course, that involves knowing how to get the equation of a, li of a line, and which, by the way, requires a point and the slope. But, uh, but in the meantime, let's uh, review the coordinate system and give you a preview of what's coming in your calculus career. Of course, the coordinate system, also known as the rectangular, um, rectangular, or they're also called it Cartesian system. Right, three, three different names to call the same thing, right? And well, you know about ordered pairs. You're giving an ordered pair. The first number is the x value. The second number is the y value, right? That's all it is. And we have a few points here to describe. The points that I have in red right here. Um, and but also we need to be, uh, we need to be sure that we know how to identify the different quadrants. So we we label the quadrants in counterclockwise direction. Quadrants one, two, three, and four. Okay, that's the direction of labeling label them. So let's let's give a let's give a name to this point. So this first point in red, it seems like we need to move one unit in the x direction and three units in the vertical in the positive vertical direction. So this means this is the point one comma three. Okay. The second point, the, this point that lies here on the x-axis, so that's five units in the x-direction, but notice there's no, there's no displacement in the y-direction. That means this is five comma zero. All right, do we agree? Okay, let's look at the next points. Well, negative two, uh, positive two, negative, negative two. And then this point, can anybody describe this point? Yes? Mm -hmm. Negative three, and call the negative two. Negative three, negative two. Negative three, negative two. And last but not least, someone else? Yes? Uh, two comma negative four. Two comma negative four, all right. Okay, so of course, I mean, uh, throughout this course, we're going to limit ourselves to work only with the rectangular system, but of course there's even more systems and I will just mention them. The, the polar, polar system. And well, the polar system, you may have seen it before if you took a pre-calculus course in, in, in the trigonometric part, which rather than just going X and Y, uh, that um, that graphs the uh, the radius and the angle, and in that system, if you've seen it before, the graphs of those functions in polar form are graphs of flowers and hearts and pretty cool stuff. Well, that's something that we're going to see in Calc 2, 
and also we get back in calc 3 as well more in depth it's a system that is used to solve other more complicated problems that otherwise we wouldn't be able to solve using the techniques or the tools that we learned in the first two calculus courses other system is the cylinder the cylindrical cylindrical coordinate which is basically the polar system the circular system in 3d and that's also something that we do in calc 3 as well as the spherical spherical coordinate that it's also it's also uh, covered in calc 3 well uh, unfortunately many problems are have a do not do not have a solution when we work with functions and values in the rectangular system so we need to uh, to warp to a different world in this case the world of polar the world of cylindrical or the world of spherical uh, where are you going to encounter this kind of problem well first you will learn the math in the subsequent courses calc 2 and calc 3 but then you will apply this in your uh, in your physics courses like uh, in particular electromagnetic fields and what else electrical circuits when you describe certain systems that are uh, you need a change in in the in the coordinate system in order to just move on through the first step of the solution of the problem but this is this is just an overview this is not something that we're going to do in this class that's something that you will see uh, in the larger world when you move on through those courses well in the meantime so let's just review some basic definitions basic formulas again from analytic geometry the distance formula and the midpoint formula and well the distance formula it's ultimately a result of uh, of the Pythagorean theorem whenever you have a point point a and point b you find the distance the linear distance between them there's a there is a displacement in the x direction x2 minus x1 and y2 minus y1 and well if we use Pythagorean theorem to find this distance that's where we get that square root of the sum of the squares of the difference between the x's and the y's right so that's where it's coming from really going into the actual derivation well let's just skip that part well the midpoint uh, of course the midpoint is a point that lies exactly in between the points and well if you observe each component x1 plus x2 divided by 2 uh, I think that reminds us of something that we compute very often you know like it's like finding the average you know when you find you want to find the average between two scores you add the two scores and divide by three you want to find the average between four scores you add the four scores and divide by four so in a way uh, the midpoint is basically the average location between between the two points so that's another way to interpret this all right so that being said how about we go about one example and well these type of exercises are very very straightforward all you need to do is plug in values and simplify there's really nothing nothing crazy about well so given the points uh, it would be great though to label x1 y1 x2 y2 hmm? bless you so let's find the distance between the points in this case the distance is the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared and let's just plug in numbers but be careful when plugging the numbers because when it comes to subtracting numbers we may end up with uh, too many negatives at the same time okay so let's subtract the x's 1 minus negative 2 1 minus negative 2 squared plus negative 4 minus 3 okay let's do one calculation at a time so what's 1 minus negative 2 
Have you ever heard of the smile rule before? No? Well, did you see the smile here, sort of? Yeah? Well, that means, well, smile, be positive. I know, it's, it's, very che it's a very cheesy one, but it's a good one to, to, re to remember why negative times a negative is positive, well, you know? So, well, one plus two, that's three. That's a three squared plus a negative seven squared. And that's a, um, well, let me, let me continue here. I, I, I wanted to have more space in here, so. So that's going to be 9 plus 49, is that a 58. 58, the square root of 58. Can we, can we simplify this? Is this number divisible by 4? Maybe, I don't think it is divisible by 4, is it? No, so let's just leave it like this. Otherwise, we would simplify by factoring perfect squares in this case, because it's a square root. So that's the distance. Uh, what about the midpoint, M? x1 plus x2 over 2 uh, y1 plus y2 over 2 just plug in the numbers and simplify that's about it so x1 which is negative 2 plus careful 1 over 2 and 3 3 plus negative 4 right over 2 and well, negative 2 plus 1, that's going to give us a negative 1 in the numerator and a 2 in the denominator, that's a negative 1 half. And 3 minus 4 is also 1, but positive in this case. So that's the, the point, whoops, that's the point in between the given two points. Alright? Which one? 3 minus 4. Oh, 3 minus 4, but in this case, since it's, uh, it's addition, we're adding a negative number, which is really subtracting the numbers. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, I guess these formulas rang a bell from the past, all right? I mean, let's just, you know clear the dust a little bit let's do a little bit more lines which is one of the most powerful tools that we require to jump into the calculus world all right so the slope of a line y2 minus y1 given the two points uh, that's actually the ratio of the rise to to the run rise over run right that's what the slope tells us about it. The information, the numerical value tells us how steep, um, you know, for example, a rooftop or in calculus three, when we look at calculus of three dimensional functions in 3D calculus, we will look at, uh, at slopes of points in 3D, you know, for example, and we will, we will be finding the points of the steepest descent or the steepest ascent. It's something like, for example, for those of you who like going hiking or something you know um uh, you you look for for those you try to avoid those places of deepest descent you know for those of you who like video games you know how this new new generation video games are a lot are about open worlds climbing mountains and of course as well you try to look for the places the of secret descent you know for example how many of you play sell the breath of the wild here have you well so when you're climbing mountains you try to avoid places where you don't where the stamina meter doesn't kick in right so and so that's pretty much a, an application of the slope and it's involved uh, video game pro, pro programmers what they do is well if the slope is this well it's link can just climb without having that stamina meter but otherwise well if it's too steep stamina meter well i so that's one amongst many many other applications of the slope and yes there's other applications of the slope in science you know like uh how many of your chemistry majors here or are or have taken a chemistry class at least okay well some of you have taken a class in a chemistry class and maybe or maybe not you may have looked at chemical uh, uh, chemical kinetics which measure which is the part of chemistry that measures the uh, 
the rates of reaction, how fast some reactions go. Some are really fast, some are just too slow. And trust me, this concept of the slope, which is simply the rise over run, which describes the steepness of a place, is very, very tied to the rate of reaction and needs. It looks like two concepts that are too far away apart, but trust me, once you get into the notation, into the description, you will see how everything is connected to that, all right? Well, in the meantime, let's keep talking about uh, the equations of the line. So we have the point slope form. Now, the, the equation that we need to do, we need the point and we need to find the slope, right? The slope intercept is that, the, that form for which you solve for y on the equation. And then we have equa vertical lines and horizontal lines. Uh, those are a couple of special cases. The horizontal line uh, happens to be the one with a slope equals to zero. And it's described with the letter y. And we also have the vertical line with the slope which is undefined, right? So pieces of information from the past again. And well, we also have the standard form of the equation, criteria for parallel equations. Two lines are parallel whenever the two lines have the same slope, but different, uh, or even the same uh, y-intercept. But otherwise, two, two equations, two linear equations, or two lines are parallel, or perpendicular rather, they form a 90 degree angle, and that happens when the slopes together are opposite in sign and also reciprocals of one another, okay? So we're gonna look at some examples of each, maybe not the parallel one, only the perpendicular. We need the perpendicular to know the, the criteria for perpendicular lines because uh, there is this concept about orthogonality. Uh, well, that or the concept of orthogonality is a concept extrapolated for more than for systems with more than three dimensions. Recall that well, uh, we can only visualize two dimensions, area, three dimensions, solid. But of course, in the more abstract, um, the more abstract systems, there's even stuff with more dimensions, five dimensions. 700 dimensions, I know that's crazy. Uh, and we use the concept of orthogonality because beyond the 2D and 3D, we cannot see the perpendicular. Okay, I mean, we can, have, we can see the, the perpendicularity in two dimensions, you know, 90 degree angle. We can see the perpendicularity in three dimensions. The black marker is perpendicular to the green one as, at the same time. The, perpen the black marker is perpendicular to the orange marker. But what about the fourth dimension, the fifth dimension? It's just so crazy. And in that, and we don't call, because we cannot visualize that. We we don't call it or we don't call it perpendicular. We call it instead uh, orthogonal. But that's something that will come later. And it all stems from the 90 degree angle in between, the, you know, all that. So let's look at one example. Find the equation of the line that passes through these points. Well, so in this case, we need two pieces of information to find the equation of the line. Number one, the slope and a point. But in this case, we don't have the slope. We have two points. But we have enough information to find the slope, right? So let's go ahead and find the slope. M, which is y2 minus y1 equals, I mean, over x2 minus x1. And that's, be careful, okay, let's label again. x1, y1, x2, y2. And just plug in the numbers. So negative four minus one, negative four minus negative one. So there's a smile rule going on in here and three minus two. So that's gonna be uh, negative three over one, which is negative three. All right. So that's the value of the slope. And then we can use the y minus y one equals m times x minus x one. Yes. Would black one be yes, that should have been a two. That is correct. Thank you. So that's a minus. What am I doing here? No, 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 no. Minus two. That's a negative six and three minus negative one. I don't know what happened here. 
So let's just move along. Nothing happened here. Nothing to see here. So that's a uh, four. And this reduces to three halves. All right? Yeah. Yeah, did anything happen? No, it doesn't seem like anything happened here. All right. Okay, so let's, let's use that slope, negative three halves. And x, in this case, you can pick your favorite point. It doesn't matter if you choose the first point or the second point, you should get the same equation. And the reason for that is that the slope was found using the two points. So either way, you get the same, the same equation. So that, I'm going to use the first one. So y minus 2 and x minus negative 1. Okay? y minus 2 equals, okay, so let me use a smile rule here, negative 3 halves, x plus 1, and that's a y minus 2 equals to negative 3 halves, x minus 3 halves, and just solve for y. y equals to um, negative 3 halves of x, and negative 3 halves plus 2, okay, 2 minus 3 halves, 2 times 2, which is 4, minus 3, it's 1 half. And that's the final answer. All right? Let's look at one more example for finding an equation of a line containing, a, containing the point, but in this case, it's perpendicular to a given line. Okay. So, if we have this line y equals 2x minus 3, from here we get that the slope m equals to 2. But again, what is the criteria for perpendicular lines? What do we do with that slope in order to find the one that is perpendicular? There's two things we need to do. Yes? So negative reciprocal. Negative reciprocal. So two operations, right? So m and this symbol that looks like an upside down uppercase T means perp. That's to denote that we're finding the slope of the perpendicular line. That's a one half with an opposite sign. And we're ready to find the equation of the line. Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1, where the Y1 is the point. Whoops, what happened here? Oh, yeah. So that's a y minus negative to another smile rule here, and negative one half x minus one. So that's y plus two, negative one half x plus one half. Careful with signs. And in this case, uh, solve for y by just subtracting two from both sides. Okay, so y equals to negative one half minus two minus two. Oh, I need an LCD two times 2, though that's a weight, not like this. So 1 minus 4, that's a negative 3, isn't it? Negative 3 halves. Okay, by looking at the two equations here again, just checking, I mean, I'm just checking for consistency between uh, between what we're doing with and with concepts. Because, I mean, typically, uh, when, it, when we're doing mathematics, sometimes we get the feel that we are just crunching numbers and symbols, but we really don't know what we, what's the behind the scenes and all that, and why do we do this, and if it's consistent, well, check the slope. The two slopes are opposite in sign, and they're also reciprocal. That means if you graph them together, they should be perpendicular to one another, all right? So... I think this is it for this section and well for the last few minutes uh, well I, I don't think I'm gonna have the time to cover the whole thing for for today but let me just give you a preview of trigonometry of course guys trigonometry is like a whole big word just give me a few more minutes give me a couple minutes Trigonometry is just a whole big world. We're, of course, we're not going to review everything about trigonometry. Uh, all that you are responsible to know about trigonometry is how to evaluate uh, the trigonometric functions for the basic angles, 60, 45, etc. And okay, guys, guys, just one minute, just one minute. Uh, so. Basic identities to perform calculations, 
we were gonna do we're gonna do this tomorrow oh, well Friday but the other point of view using special triangles so but we will do this next time right I'll be here for a couple minutes if you have questions I'll be around otherwise have a great day I'm Ryan. Nice to meet you, bro.